after Orly, and she told the judges in court, brought the witness by airplane from the East Coast to the West Coast, and he's on the plane. Then at 5.05 on the 2nd of January, he sends her an order saying only oral arguments, but it's too late. Now the witness is already on the plane. I think they're trying to just run Orly and her supporters out of money. But there's no particular reason that makes any sense why the judge couldn't have said, well, I'm going to let you qualify your witnesses and let them testify. And of course, Attorney Olson uh, standing in, defending Obama's side, or actually defending the Secretary of State, which is a Democrat, allowing the 53 electoral votes to go to Obama. And then there was also uh, Attorney Waters, who was representing the governor, who said almost nothing. In fact, during most of this hearing on January 3rd, yesterday, the judge did all the arguing for the defense. I thought that was just, that was so out of the norm. The judge, you know, he opened up the court by saying, first of all, I'm making an order right here, right now, order, no recording to voices, may record anything in this courtroom. What happened to transparency, Judge Morrison England Jr., who was appointed by George W. Bush? What happened to transparency? And if you're making a recording electronically in a federal courtroom, why can't other people make their own recording? Is it because you want the ability to doctor your own recording? Get people to swear to the falsehood I don't know I see no transparency in this this hearing there's no reason why they couldn't let Paul testify and later you'll hear uh, before we finish tonight you'll hear from Pamela Barnett a retired military officer who does background checks and qualifies people she's in communications with a branch of military, and that was her service, and her expertise was to make sure people had clearances, you know, top secret and so on, and she deals in that arena, and they said, we don't know what her qualifications, so we're not even going to let her get on the witness stand so we can find out. That was Judge Morris in England. Thank you, George W. Bush. Bush put that black judge in there, and what was just really I mean, I don't care if he's black or white. Judge Carter was a white dude and a U.S. Marine. I don't care about the race. But what was interesting is Orly started to raise the argument that a black judge, first black judge to be in the U.S. Supreme Court was a guy named Thurman, uh, I'm sorry. Thurman, <laughs> I got it. Thurman Marshall. Marshall. First black judge and people kept saying no to him, no to him, no to him. And he'd have cases, and they would just say no, no, no. They didn't want him on there. And they kept slamming doors in his faces. And while Orly Tate's a very white, with very white hair, very white woman, uh, born in Moldavia, uh, 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 a little country swallowed up by Russia, communist Soviet Union, actually, uh, who's a, a naturalized American citizen, and she's arguing this to a black judge named Morrison England, and he puts his head back and folds his arms, I wish I'd had a camera in there, and looks down his black nose at her and basically says it's irrelevant. And she says, Susan B. Anthony also fought for civil rights. They even threw her in jail. Now, why did she say that? Because Judge Morrison had put his head back, was looking down his black nose at this white woman from the federal bench, and he's saying, you know, well, I know all about your cases, and I know why you keep bringing all these cases against Obama. Weren't you sanctioned? I know you were sanctioned. $20,000 in another federal court. Why don't you give up and stop? That's basically what he's saying. And he's looking down his nose as she brings up Thurman Marshall and Susan B. Anthony, and Orly points out, and Susan B. Anthony also went to jail to get the vote in equal rights for women. And here's a black judge supposedly from a black genealogy of slaves, theoretically, in the Old South, looking down her nose when she brings up, he, she brings up Marshall, the first U.S. black Supreme Court justice. 
I now know why he would not allow cameras in that courtroom. And even though he came on very strong and tried to sound like he was being very fair and pointed out, I don't even have to allow oral arguments. I can just read your motions in my chambers and make a ruling and, and have no public appearance, no debate at all. That's true under their federal rules. Transparency is disappearing in the judiciary. They're banning cameras. They're saying you got to put in a media request five days, ten days, and then they get to say no for any reason. What these judges are forgetting is they help create Nazi America. And make no doubt, Nazi America is here. It's now. If Obama truly cannot prove he had a Selective Service card, which every young man was required, if you're a U.S. citizen, to get back in those days of the 60s. I had one. Even if you, had, you were flat-footed and ruled 4F, which means you never have to go serve, you had to go get the card. Every able-bodied man had to get one. Obama can't produce one. Orley was making that argument. And what did Judge Morris in England say? I heard him with my own ears. I was in the front row. There was only 55 seats in that federal courtroom, and every single one of them was filled. And so was the jury. And there were five media people. And I'm wondering if there's going to be any stories in the Sacramento Bee or in the Mercury, the Mercury Gazette or whatever they call it. I'm wondering if anybody's going to cover this. But I'm telling you, uh, I'm going to show you the interviews as you just saw, Paul, I'm going to show you another one before we're done tonight so that you can see it. To me, it was a travesty. This judge comes on and says, well, why did you file too late? And Orly, and you know, this is like her followers are all in there, 55 of them, and they're like, late? You mean she filed late? And then Orly doesn't let them get away with it. She stands up, Your Honor, I filed on the 13th, and I was told you know, by Judge Miller, another federal judge, I was told I had till the 21st, but I filed in time. Now, when she filed back in the primary period, they said she filed too soon. So now they say she's filing too late. It doesn't matter when she files. And I was there in September of 2009 down in the Ronald Reagan federal courthouse. And you can go on YouTube, put in Obama's real birth certificate, uh, September 2009, and you pull up my interviews with more than 120,000 views because I was the only person there who was doing a television show. ABC did not show up, Fox, CNN, none of them. They were all absent without leave on the job. A-W-O-L from being true media. They're all been anesthetized. They're what they call embedded with the criminal government. So... We're going to bring you that in a few minutes, but I have uh, a Lompoki in here who has his own tragedy, was royally screwed over by corrupt system. I want to welcome Dan Petrie to the show. Hello, Dan. Hey, Mr. Wagner. I'm glad you're here. Let me get these out of your way. Nice to be back. What do you got there? Write us by this Wish thing before was, we're out of time. Hey, I'll be as quick as I can. I know he's got stuff to do. It's nice to be back uh, on One Second Thought, I Take Back America, and... Uh, my name is Dan Petrie from uh, Lompoc, California. I live in Vanner Village, actually. And uh, many years ago, for the audience that doesn't know, I was a victim of a police crime and then a cover-up of that crime by the police. So as I started to dig up evidence on my case to clear my name because I knew I was a victim of a police crime, I started to just dig up a lot of evidence on corrupt police. And I've basically now been doing that for 32 years as a hobby, um, called a weird hobby, but... Somebody has to do it, just like Mr. Wagner takes on the cases he does. Somebody has to do it because basically no one else is. Without what he's doing, you would know about 99% of the cases he covers, and without me doing what I do, you wouldn't know about what I cover. So that's my background. So um, what I do is I put my name behind victims of police crimes, families, and I try to get justice for the families by investigating the case first and then getting you know, local, national, worldwide attention to the case. And one of the, I got some cases to go really quick. First of all, the Kelly Thomas case out of Fullerton, if you remember where the 135 pound mentally ill homeless man was beat to death by the Fullerton Six. Um, 
that case is now the DA Rockalkis says it will be 12 to 18 months before he goes to trial on that case, and it took him over almost a year and a half just to, to bring charges. So it's going to be a three-year trial against the police officers, and of course, if there was anybody else that had been over two years ago. But that's ridiculous, Dan. It is ridiculous. That's ridiculous. They got it all on tape. Right, it's all they on tape. They got the beating on tape. Why do they need? Another year and a half to bring you know, yeah, this It's trial. an obvious open and shut case, and it's going to take them three years to And are they trial. indicting all six of the cops? No, involved? they actually let three of them uh, are back on duty because they just oh didn't find God. enough fault in their activity. Oh, my God. Even though they could have stopped the beating at any time, um, they actually, like, didn't actually... God have mercy. Oh, uh, my God. ...beat Mr. Thomas, supposedly... They're accessories. I know. To, they're accessories to the crime. Exactly. They, they are. stood kept people that might have saved that young man. They kept them away and watched the crime. They're accessories. Right. If, if, anybody... if, if six people from the Crips had gathered around and two of them beat to death, you think they wouldn't have all six members of the Crips on criminal charges? Exactly. And to me, it was a, a first-degree uh, hate crime of a mentally ill homeless man, which is what the charges should have been, in my opinion. But just to get second-degree charged against one, excessive force against another. What I didn't understand was all three are charged differently. Uh, they all committed the same crime, and they're all three charged differently. That didn't make any sense to me either. But I guess when you break the tape down, the DA micro uh, analyzed everything to where he could get the least charges possible, where a, a, a DA in any other case with a private citizen would be trying to get the most charges against a private citizen. But when it's a police officer, you try to get the least amount of charges you can charge. Do you agree with that, Mr. Wagner? I do. Yes, thank you. So that'll be, uh, and plus the, the thing I really think that's sad about that case is uh, numerous witnesses that are in that case probably feel threatened in that case, and some might end up, you know, disappearing. Conveniently and, dead, maybe? Conveniently, Just conveniently exactly. Conveniently died, so they can't testify when we and need them? And if you don't think that can happen, um, they tried to do that to me in my case. So um, I actually did have two attempts made on my life during my investigation to clearing my name. So um, the police are capable of anything up to and including uh, murder. So um, another thing I like to say is you always have to call it a police misconduct case. Um, you can never would, and it is an, it's an alleged murder, really, but you can't say that. You have to say police misconduct just sounds better, I guess. Gee, would it sound better if, if we saw a uh, member of the Bloods or the Crips? Blood misconduct. Blood misconduct. Crip, crip, mi crip misconduct. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's, I, I mean, it's this is. It's this laughable. Is... It is. It's laughable. I'm sorry, I interrupt you. Go ahead. Well, that's fine. I'm glad you're as passionate about it as I am, because a lot of people are, and that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get people uh, as passionate about cleaning up the police in this nation as as both of us are. Now, the latest case I got sent to me was the Ernesto Duenas a junior shooting case. Um, an article, uh, Lydia Warren from the Mail. Uh, mail own uh, it's just a website of course um, he was in a domestic dispute and he was pulled over by a Manteca police officer named James Moody and he got out of the passenger side of a truck at, at uh, his home and his wife was there and she came running out to see him and it all happened within seconds the video is on YouTube it's very graphic um, the police officer thought he had a throwing knife and he would have had to be a heck of his throw to hit him from about 25 to 30 feet while he was falling out of a truck with his foot stuck in a seat belt. Um, he was shot 11 times, uh, numerous times in the back. You can actually see him shot in the back. Um, did you see that video, Mr. Wagner, by any chance? No, I didn't. Oh, okay, no problem. Um, you guys can, can YouTube that. It's the Ernesto Duenitz Jr. shooting case. Um, and, of course, he died after James Moody shot him. He then cuffed him. He then searched him. So he shot first, then he cuffed him, then he searched him. And Officer James Moody, Manteca Police, has been cleared of all wrongdoing because he thought he had a throwing knife. So... Um, the other thing that I want to talk about and touch on is a friend of mine is send, sends me dog killings all over the nation, and the police are killing dogs all over the nation. I mean, they're killing little cute puppies, the, you know, of course, dogs they might have to shoot. I'm, I'm not saying all police shootings of dogs are not justified, 
but they're basically shooting, you know, if you call a police officer, you better lock your dog up.